Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 5. This is the mitotic cell cycle. In this chapter, there are two major parts. Part number one is cell division, which basically goes through the entire process of mitosis and the cell cycle. Um, and there's part two, which is about regulation of the cell cycle and what happens when it goes wrong. So yeah, before we start off anything, including part one and part two, let's start off with a little introduction uh, outlying the terminology of things. So there are a few similar terms that you have heard of, right? There is like gene, chromosome, DNA, um, and you have heard of chromatin at this point. And today we'll be learning another word called chromatid. So what are all these words and how exactly are they different? So let's start off with this. Yeah, these are chromosomes. What you're looking at is actually a uh, DNA that is tightly wound into a condensed structure. So this is the chromosome right here. Here's the DNA. So how is it wrapped? Okay, how is DNA wrapped around? Now double helix DNA is associated with histone proteins. In us, uh, this is for eukaryotes only, by the way. And you can see how the double helix DNA wraps and coils around these um, histones. Now histones are usually octamers, which means they are made out of um, octamers, which are, they are made out of eight different subunits. Okay, so there are eight different eight histones here. And eight histones with the DNA around them, histones and DNA, Okay, one of them like this make up something called nucleosomes. Many of these nucleosomes form what we know as chromatin. Okay, so this entire structure here, DNA wrapped around histones, uh, and sometimes we call it beats on a string it appears like beats on a string Be string is the dna beats are the histones right and this structure here is chromatin and and usually it's found in this form so when the cell is not dividing when the cell is just going to its normal period of life right dna is usually found in the form of chromatin However, during cell division, this chromatin undergoes further coiling into chromatin fiber and then into a chromosome. So it wraps and wraps and wraps and wraps, forming a very condensed structure. Okay, so imagine this, right? You have a lot of DNA in each cell. And do you know if you connect the DNA in your cells uh, end to end and join them into one straight piece, that piece of DNA, that length of DNA will be around 1.5 meters long per cell in one cell. Okay, DNA is very, very long. That's a very small molecule. So if you can wrap and call it into a very condensed structure, then it can fit into one small nucleus in one single cell using this DNA packaging mechanism here. Now, if you need some visualization, here is a video in order to show you how it's done. Okay, you can see here the double helix DNA and how it's wrapping around the histone. That's the histone protein. There are a few subunits that come together to form a nucleosome. That nucleosome, many, many of them form the chromatin fiber. And this is how the cell usually has DNA in uh, when it's not dividing. However, when that chromatin fiber wraps and coils around itself, as you can see now, this forms chromosomes, which are visible under the light microscope. This is the cell when it's dividing. It looks amazing, right? All those noodle-like things you're looking at, those are all chromosomes. And you can see it start to decondense as cell division ends. 
Okay, so now you know how DNA is related to a chromosome. DNA is mostly like a general term, uh, usually referring to a double helix structure, whereas chromosomes is tightly wound DNA uh, that's associated with histones. Now, what are we looking at when we look at chromosomes exactly? Uh, when we look at one chromosome, every single chromosome is a length of DNA that's tightly coiled, yes, and it actually codes for several thousand genes. One chromosome is actually quite a long piece of DNA that is condensed, right? So it can contain a lot of information. Each gene con are DNA that codes for protein. This is a definition of gene. When we say gene, we mean the DNA that codes for protein. Now you may be asking, are there DNA that do not code for protein? And the answer is yes, and we'll cover that more in A2, honestly. But yes, for now, just remember, this definition very important. Genes are DNA that codes for protein. The position of gene in the chromosome is called locus. And if you are a member of the same species, for example, individual A, B, and C here are from the species, then the gene will be on the same chromosome and loci. Loci, whatever you say. However you say it, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, so same chromosome. Uh, what we mean is same type of chromosome. So the chromosomes are kind of the same size across the different species. And you can see here on each of those chromosomes, um, the gene is at this particular position, right? This particular position. Now, genes though can have different forms. As you can see here, these are called alleles. Alleles are different forms of one gene. And in this example, we can see that this gene codes for eye color. So I'll call it eye color gene. And this gene is present at the same chromosome and same loci across the different individuals. But each individual has different alleles, right? These are different forms of one gene. This is another very important definition. Different alleles can code for different color, eye color here, and one can be recessive and one can be dominant, or both can be dominant, both can be recessive, okay? It depends on the individual. Uh, however, when both of them are present, so when, like in individual A, we have blue eyes and brown eyes, but since the blue eyes is the recessive allele, this individual A will have brown eyes, will have the dominant trait. We'll explore more about dominant and recessive trait when we go into A2. So don't worry about it now. Just two definitions you have to know for sure. Number one, the genes are DNA that codes for protein, and alleles are a different form of that one gene. Okay, more about chromosomes. Now, I don't know if you realize, but individual A had two chromosomes and two alleles of one gene, right? And that pair of chromosomes are actually called homologous chromosomes. We are all diploid organisms, and Therefore, we have pairs of chromosomes, one from our mom, one set from our mom, and one set from our dad. Okay, so one is maternal and one is paternal, and that's why they're usually colored in this form, right? One red and one blue, but this is all CGI, okay? Your chromosomes are not actually colored. Now, homologous chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, have similar centromere position. Centromere is this region right here. Okay. And um, they have similar size and shape. And usually they have the same genes, but may have different alleles. Uh, may, because some of them may be the same. But yeah, generally, same genes, different alleles. Now, usually we see them as like chopstick or like half a butterfly like this. And sometimes we see them like butterfly shape like this. Why is that? Now, this form of chromosome that you can see here is actually before replication. After replication, the chromosomes uh, are visible in the form of sister chromatids. This is one single chromatid after duplication they become sister chromatids. So there are two copies of that chromatid. 
This happens during DNA replication during interface, which we will talk more about in the next video. Uh, and as I said just now, one chromatid becomes two. These sister chromatids are called sister because they are identical and they have identical copies of genes. And as you can see here, big G, this one's also big G, big R, big R, big S, big S, small T, small T, right? These are all genes that are the same, right? Both sides are the same. And they are held together at the centromere position here, okay? This holds the two chromatids together. Now, I want to add one point here, that although this is one chromatid and this is two chromatids, okay, this is still considered one chromosome. And this is also still considered one chromosome. Okay, it's just in different form. This chromosome appears in the form of a chromatid, whereas this chromosome here, okay, appears in the form of sister chromatids. So they are in different forms, but they are still considered one chromosome. We calculate the number of chromosomes by looking at the number of centromere. So this is one chromosome, this is one chromosome, whoops, sorry about that. All right, this is one chromosome, this is one chromosome, this only has one pro uh, one centromere, so this entire thing is one chromosome, and this entire blue butterfly thing is also considered one chromosome. We calculate chromosomes by the centromere. Here is a labeled diagram of all of, all of the terms we just said. Um, with the addition of one term, this is one chromosome with sister chromatids, the middle is called centromere, and the ends of the chromosome here, 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 and here, they are called telomere. Telo means end. So they are at the end of the chromosome. We'll talk more about telomeres in our next few videos, okay? All right, last few terminologies. Now, we did say that one set is from your mom and one set of your is from your dad, right? One set of chromosomes. And this makes us a diploid, um, diploid organism. Our diploid number, 2n, 2n equals 46. Our diploid number equals 46. And this means we have 23 sets of chromosomes, 23 pairs, if you may. And you can see here that the total set of chromosomes in us is labeled according to size. You can see here that chromosome 1 is the biggest, whereas chromosome 22 is the tiniest. Uh, X and Y are the exception here. Now, we have different names for chromosomes as well. For X and Y, we call them sex chromosomes, and everything else, we call them autosomes. So autosomes are all chromosomes besides sex chromosomes. So yeah, that is all the terminology you need to understand this chapter. Now, I can't highlight how important um, terminology is, because it really helps you understand the subject matter more if you know the differences in vocabulary and it will help you when you write your answers. You're able to be more precise and more clear when you write your answers and there'll be less confusion.